Well, we welcome a good friend, uh, Pastor Harvey Hampton. I'm going to introduce him in just a minute, but welcome to our program, Harvey. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. This is an interesting program, folks. We have a former judge, that's me, interviewing a former drug dealer. Yes. Now, talk to me. Do you really dealt drugs, right? Oh, yes, sir. No doubt about it. How, how long ago? I met Jesus 41 years ago, okay. July 1st, 1976, 7.55 p.m. on a Thursday. By the time I was 19, six different denominations had baptized me, and I memorized everything, went through confirmation class, catechism, jumped through all the hoops, memorized everything. And so as I went to different churches through friends, my folks, Boy Scouts, I would ask questions as we were in Bible studies and such, and they would say, well, you need to, eventually they'd come around and say, you need to get baptized. I said, I've done that. Well, you need to do it with us. So six different denominations have baptized me, and I didn't know God from a donut. I knew all about God, and I tell people, God doesn't want us to just know about him and be a Christian encyclopedia. He wants us to know him and be his child, our Father, which art in heaven. It's an intimate relationship. So when my folks divorced the second time, my dad told me he was going to divorce my mom, I went outside and started i was crying i begged him not to and he said how they old had were you to. how old were you that i time? was about 15 i was think i was going in the ninth grade if okay. i remember all right and uh i went outside friends of mine came by i got in the car they were smoking dope they've been trying to get me to smoke dope for a year i kept telling them it's a, i don't want to be a dope so i wouldn't have nothing to do with it but as i rode around with them it calmed me down the the smoke and, and I, I'm a high-strung person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I finally said, let me try it. It made me forget my problems. When I woke up in the morning uh, after going home, I saw my parents and started crying again. I went to school and said to the guys, I want to do it again. And they told me I needed to buy it. And so I became a drug dealer that day. I bought an amount, started s selling smaller amounts, and worked up to where when I met Jesus, I was making somewhere between two and five thousand dollars a week at 19 years of age i did not do b and e's i didn't do what a lot of people did i didn't carry guns i just wanted to stay high because it i didn't know how to deal with the problems of life i didn't know how to deal with hurts and issues and relationships and the way people hurt you and so by staying high it just kept me numb and kept me out of pain uh, the drugs kept you out of pain, so yep. and you'd been already to a number of churches. You've been baptized yep. many times, but yep. not a real Christian. So what nope. turned the corner for you? I was living on Florida State University campus, Tallahassee, Florida, where I'm from. I was smoking a joint with a guy one day named Joe, a new friend, and he asked me, what are you going to do during the summer? I said, well, I deliver auto parts, so nobody asked me where I get my money. I said, but I've got to find a way to get back into university, which I had dropped out of. And I had taken four years of Latin in high school. I was going to become a lawyer. And uh, I said, but I've got to find a way to legally pay for it. He said, well, I made enough money last summer selling books door to door. And the main book was the Bible as we were smoking a joint. And I said, I'm not in the Bible. And he said, neither am I. But there's more Bibles sold every year in the whole world than any other book. So I wasn't sure I wanted to go door to door. And I thought about it. But I had some things happen in my life. I wrecked my car, bought a motorcycle. The company I was working for sold out to another company that I didn't want to go for, uh, go to. And then I also had a bad drug deal where somebody pulled a gun and had the guns right in my face telling me he was going to kill me. And I thought, I need to get out of town uh, and just get away from from all this and go do something different. I need to get back into school. Mm -hmm. So I called him the night before he left and threw my motorcycle in the back of his van. We took off to Nashville. When we got there, there was about 500 to 1,000 college students recruited from universities all over America to do this during the summer. And uh, we went to school every day for a week. They had this big class and they taught us how to go door to door and memorize all these things mm -hmm. and get familiar with the six different books we were going to sell, four of them related to the Bible. Now, here I am with hair down to my waist, earring in my ear, and $1,000 worth of PCP in my pocket, which is a type of drug, mm -hmm. when I met Jesus shortly after this. But this is what I looked like, and I was the only one, only guy that showed up with long hair because all the rest of them had been recruited, and I was kind of drafted in at the last minute. And so they all called me the pusher man. They 
smoke my dope and whatever. Uh, at the end of the week of training, they uh, put me with a couple of jacks over by Knoxville. Okay. And we would go door to door 12 hours a day, knocking on doors. Hi, I'm Joe, college student, trying to work my way through college. Did, did you get your hair cut before you did that? I did. I cut my I'm, hair. I'm glad to hear that. You want to sell a few books. Well, right? Those, you call them uh, rednecks. I call them grits, and I didn't want the grits to cut my head off. <laughs> and so I pulled the earring in my ear. Back then, nobody wore earrings sure. except women and rebels, and I was a rebel. Yep. And uh, cut my hair off, so I looked like regular guy. Anyway, 12 hours a day did this. Well, I wasn't doing so well because I'm partying at night, doing drugs, and then during the day I'm trying to sell Bibles. And James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, can't go in two directions at the same time. Started trying to sell these books, wasn't doing so well. I asked my boss, how can I how can I sell these books better? He said, any salesman to sell his product needs to know his product. Start reading the different books. Well, I started reading the different books. When I came to the Bible, nobody had ever got me to read the Bible in my whole life. They just told me what it said. And on the cover, it said, Words of Christ in Red. And I flipped through till I came to Red Print, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I lit up a joint. This is Wednesday, June 30th, 1976. And I read all four Gospels that night, 89 chapters, tried doing that. As I read it, I saw that everybody that Jesus came in contact with, their life was never the same from every walk of life. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, how do I get to you, Jesus? I've done everything churches tell me how to do. They all pat me on the back, tell me I'm a good old boy, but something's missing. And then I saw Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know, know not what they do. But what I heard inside of me was father forgive harvey for he doesn't know what he's doing mm. and it broke my heart and i got it, it just i just wanted jesus more and more and i just couldn't put the bible down and i read it that night and i went to bed and when i woke up in the morning god was just dealing with me like he was the way i said he was all over me like white on rice turning me every way but loose and I knew I was going to go to hell that day if I didn't find the answer, but I didn't even know what the question was, mm -hmm. but I knew the answer was in that Bible. So I was a door-to-door -door salesman. So I went door-to-door -door for five hours asking somebody to tell me how to get to Jesus. And I had three questions. I would knock on the door and they come to the door and I'd say, are you a Christian? And they go, oh yeah, I'm an American. And I'd say, do you go to church? And they go, yeah, twice a year, whether I need it or not, I'm a C&E Christian. I go Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and then I'd say, can you tell me how to get to Jesus? And at this point, I point at my nose because opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. They just smell. Mm -hmm. And for five hours, all I got was a bunch of opinions. Come join our Glee Club, our church. Come meet my preacher. Sure. Quit this. Start yep. that. Yep. And everything they told me I had done. I kept saying, that's not it. And I kept handing them a Bible because they couldn't find their Bible. Mm -hmm. So I'd hand them a Bible. I had them in my hand and would say, please show me in the Bible the answer because I know it's in there. I was reading it last night. And nobody for five hours, and I ran from door to door. I would go to, into a house. I'd only be there a few minutes. It's like they don't have what I'm looking for. I'm running to the next house. No kidding. And I thought I was going to go to hell any minute. I was under Holy Ghost conviction. At quarter to two, I knocked on this guy's door, and it was this huge mountain man wearing bib overalls. And right at the door, he pointed at me and said, boy, you need to get born again. I said, what's that? He said, you need to get saved. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Boy, get in the house. Every time I asked, I spent another five hours with this man from quarter to two to quarter to seven. And every time I asked this man a question, he would say, I don't know, boy, but the Bible says. And he'd either quote the Bible or start reading the Bible. And down in my belly, it rang true. I knew he had what I was looking for, but he was way too big to choke it out of him. So I didn't know what to do because he just, I knew he had what I was looking for. And it was like, please give me. But he didn't know how to do that or it wasn't time. Mm -hmm. And so he took me to meet his preacher. His preacher said, tell me about your life. I told him about my life. I told him I had smoked dope. I didn't tell him I had $1,000 worth in my pocket. He said, if you could know what God wanted you to do, would you do it? And I remember thinking, if I could know that God is real, not hope he's real, wish he's real, try for him to be real. But if I could, like grabbing something right now, solidly know that God is real. And if I could have this burden lift off my heart, which was God dealing with me about my sin and my condition, I'd do whatever God wanted. And the preacher said, well, let's pray. So he fell on his knees. The mountain man got on his knees. I knew it was time to pray, but the only two prayers I knew was time to eat and time to go to sleep. And, mm -hmm. and I'd memorized and I didn't know, didn't seem like it was time to do either one of those. So I got on my knees and, and the preacher said, God, Harvey wants to tell you something. 
And when he said that, with my eyes closed, I saw Jesus Christ himself walk in the room. I don't remember his face. What I remember is his nail-scarred hands as he held him out and walked toward me because he wanted me. Yes. I didn't even always want me. And here's Jesus. And I knew who he was because I'd been in church all my life in one way or the other. And I knew who I was because in the old dictionaries on the word center, it says, see Harvey, because if you can do it wrong, I've done it. And I was amazed that he wanted me. And as he kept walking toward me, I started confessing my sin and naming my sin and telling him all the things I had done, naming them, not in generality, but in mm-hmm. specific. Mm-hmm. And after about 15 minutes, I realized I'm not getting near the bottom of the barrel here. I'm like, I don't know what else to do, God. I don't know if I said it or just thinking it. And I heard this voice and I, I noticed the guy's mouths weren't moving and it said, the voice sounded different. So I know it was God. And it wasn't like I heard an audible voice, but in my heart. And it was like, Harvey, look behind you. And I turned around and I looked and I saw this big body of water. And the voice said, you see that ocean? It's full of your sin. You're trying to empty it with a little thimble of confession. You'll never get it empty. You can't even remember them all. And at that point, I yelled out, I don't know what else to do, God. And the preacher said, could I help you pray? And I said, I wish you would. And as he started praying, he goes, God, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. And I said, nope. I said, I've said that before. My dad used to say, let's put everything on the table and deal with it. Mm -hmm. I said, let's get real. I said, God, I'm sorry that I'm a low down, sorry, scumbait, wretched, in the gutter, wicked, vile sinner. I'm not just a sinner. Mm -hmm. Then the preacher said, in Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. And when he said that, I sensed the presence of God lean right down to me. And he said, Harvey, what Jesus did is enough for you. And when you read in Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, it says, when thou, when you shall make Christ's soul an offering for your sin, he, the father, shall see the travail, the suffering of Christ and shall be satisfied. Jesus says, father, is my death enough for Harvey or is there something else Harvey has to do? And the father reached over, picked up the body of Jesus from the dead and said, paid in full. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. Mm -hmm. He didn't say to be continued by Harvey. So the father accepted what Jesus did for me. So all of a sudden the preacher was like, Harvey, stand up. And I became aware of the physical again and I'm my shirt's all wet and I stand up and this great weight came off of me, which the Bible says all my sin is being forgiven through Jesus, my past, present and future. It's all paid for by Jesus. And this super love came inside of me two times in first John chapter four, it says, God is love. Now that's agape love, unconditional, eternal, never give up on another love. Not that bumper sticker, I heart my chihuahua stuff. It's like love, like I'd never experienced. And I grabbed the preacher and I started dancing around the room and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's what I've been looking for my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then I let go of him and I grabbed the mountain man. As I danced around with him, I looked up, I saw the clock and it said 755. That's how I know I met Jesus at 755. And my motorcycle was in a shop. And so my roommates had to pick me up and the mountain man told me he'd drop me off at a certain corner. And I reminded him of that. We jumped in his van. I'm yelling hot dog and hallelujah. He dropped me off at the corner. I'm standing there going berserk, just praising God. (laughs) And my roommates pulled up and they thought I had OD'd. And they took me back to our trailer where we lived. I heard them talking outside my door. Uh, my bedroom door, because I went in my bedroom and was just saying, I got to have more of Jesus. And I heard him talking about taking me to the hospital. And I opened the door, told him I hadn't done any drugs, you know, that I just met God. And mm-hmm. they they just looked at me like an RCA dog and went, huh? Because they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> They'd never met him. And I just for an hour just kept pacing back and forth saying, I just met Jesus. How do I get more of Jesus? You know, at night, how you pull everything out of your pockets? Well, I pulled out $1,000 worth of PCP. I lived from one drug deal to the next. And I looked at it and I said, you know, all this time I thought I was getting high. I just met the one you can't get higher than. So I went in the bathroom and I gave him a swirly and flushed them all down the commode. Everybody's on a diet. Mine was beer. Opened the refrigerator, pulled it out and said, this is spirits, but it ain't no Holy Spirit. I uncorked everyone and poured it in the commode. Reached in my pocket, pulled up my cigarette, said, ain't going to hell. No, you smell like I've been there. Poured them down the commode. Nobody told me. I just didn't want anything but Jesus. All I wanted was Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't want anything to get in the way. 
So I go to bed, I wake up in the morning, and I'm about to bust with Jesus. So I'm a door-to-door -door salesman. So I go door-to-door, -door, and when people would answer the door, I would yell out, Did you know God's real? And people would freak out and go, Yeah, I go to church. I'm like, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about Jesus. Well, this cop pulls up and says, uh, Come here, boy. So I walk over to him and he says, what are you doing? So I told him about Jesus and he says, it sounds like you got saved. I said, I think that's what they called it. And a call came over the radio and said, have you found that boy yet? <laughs> Three more people called that he scared. Get that boy in jail. He said, 10-4. He said, son, I was sent down here to put you in jail because you're scaring everybody. I said, but I just met God. Why didn't people tell me I could meet God before instead of making me jump through all those hoops? And he's like, son, you got to calm down. I got to put you in jail. And I said, how do I calm down? He said, go find a Christian, tell him what happened, and ask him if you stay there for a few hours until you calm down. So I did that, but I couldn't calm down, and it's only been 41 years, and I can't quit talking about it. <laughs> That's a great story, Harvey. Now, you're actually married. A, a woman puts up with you. How long have you been married? 40 years. 40 years. April 30th and was got, 40 years. You got a child or two, don't you? We have six kids, 23 grandkids so far, 10 great-grandkids. Oh, that's awesome. And you're, you're, you are a pastor. When he called me to preach, mm -hmm. I was at the altar, and there was all these people at the altar, and I kept saying, God, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to preach. Well, I, I, I told him, you can't mean me. I was a drug dealer, so I kept scooching down. And whichever way I scooched, he kept saying, I want you to preach. But I kept telling him, I don't mean to eavesdrop. I, I don't know who you're talking to here. <laughs> and finally, after about 30 minutes, everybody was gone from the altar. And he said, I want you to preach. And I looked around. There was nobody there. And I said, but God, I was a drug dealer. And he said, Harvey, you're not only going to preach, you're going to preach to and train ministers. All five of my married kids that were called in the ministry, they've all been in ministry of some sort. And... We've led thousands, I don't know, tens of thousands of people to Jesus, pimps, prostitutes, pushers, druggies, drunks, policemen, presidents of corporations, two professional hitmen. Uh, I'm dealing with one like that right now, another one. Mm. And uh, God has me witness to pastors. I've met and preached for pastors that don't know God from a donut, not born again, mm. just professional clergymen, but they don't know Jesus. And I don't... I don't want to judge anybody. What I want to do is help everybody to know him. And it's like, I, I find that God loves every single person and it doesn't matter what deception or sin that we're in. God will come to us right where we are. He doesn't, it's not like we got to straighten up. It's that we need to turn to him. We need to listen to him. But Luke 19, 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We don't find God. He's not lost. We're lost. He finds us. Mm -hmm. And all we got to do is, and he comes to us right where we are, and he begins to deal with us and touch our hearts mm -hmm. and send people into our lives. It's how we respond. 